Egypt is about to flood one of the driest places on earth. On purpose. They're literally carving a hole in the desert to let the Mediterranean Sea rush in and create a massive artificial lake. Sounds insane, right? Well, it gets better. This isn't some abandoned fever dream from a dictator with too much free time. This is happening. Or at least, it's supposed to happen. And the consequences? Let's just say Mother Nature might have a few opinions about humanity playing God with 44,000 square kilometers of sand. So buckle up. We're about to dive into one of the most ambitious and potentially catastrophic engineering projects you've never heard of. Keep watching and find out why Egypt's grand plan might just rewrite the rules of desert geography forever. Egypt has a problem. Actually, Egypt has several problems. But today we're talking about the big one. Population. Over 100 million people crammed into a country that's 96% uninhabitable desert. Yeah, you rate that right. 96%. Most Egyptians live along the Nile River, and in the Nile Delta, which makes up only about 4% of Egypt's total land area. That's roughly 40,000 square kilometers supporting 100 million people. That's like cramming the entire population of Germany into an area smaller than the Netherlands. Cozy, right? Not exactly. Cairo alone has over 20 million people, making it one of the most densely populated cities on the planet. And it's not getting any better. Egypt's population is growing by about 2 million people every year. That's adding a city the size of Houston annually. Where do you put them all? The Nile's not getting any bigger. In fact, it might be getting smaller, thanks to climate change and Ethiopia's new dam upstream. But that's a whole other geopolitical nightmare we don't have time for. The point is, Egypt needs more livable space. Fast. Enter the Katara Depression. Never heard of it? Don't worry, most people haven't. It's one of the most remote and inhospitable places on Earth. Located in northwestern Egypt, about 60 kilometers from the Mediterranean coast, the Kotar Depression is a massive geological cavity. We're talking 19,605 square kilometers of absolutely nothing. That's roughly the size of Slovenia, or bigger than the state of New Jersey. But here's the kicker. The Katara Depression isn't just low, it's really low. Parts of it sit 133 meters below sea level. That's 436 feet down. The second lowest point in Africa right after Lake Asal in Djibouti. Only Death Valley in California goes lower in terms of accessible depressions. And unlike Death Valley, which gets tourists and Instagram influencers, Kutera gets approximately nobody because it's a death trap. The floor of the depression is covered in salt marshes, quicksand, and salt pans that can swallow vehicles whole. Both the Allies and the Axis forces considered Kyoterra strategically useless because it was literally impassable. Too dangerous to cross, too remote to matter. The British used it as a natural barrier. It was the ultimate no man's land. But one man's death trap is another man's opportunity. A German scientist named Friedrich Bassler looked at this massive hole in the ground, sitting just 60 kilometers from the Mediterranean, and had an idea. A crazy, ambitious, potentially brilliant idea. What if you filled it with seawater? Think about it. You've got a giant depression sitting below sea level. You've got an ocean right next door. Gravity does most of the work. All you need is a canal, or a tunnel, or both. Let the Mediterranean rush in, fill up the depression, create a massive inland sea, and boom, instant oasis, fresh coastline, fishing opportunities maybe even hydroelectric power from all that water rushing downhill. Basler wasn't the first to think of it, actually. The idea had been floating around since the late 19th century when European explorers first mapped the Depression. But Basler was the first to seriously calculate the engineering requirements and potential benefits. He published his findings and got people excited. Really excited. By the 1970s, Egypt was genuinely considering the project. They called it the Katera Depression Project original name. I know. The plan was to dig or blast a canal from the Mediterranean to the Depression, let seawater flow in, and create a lake roughly the size of Lake Ontario. The water would generate hydroelectric power as it flowed downhill. The lake would moderate the local climate, potentially increasing rainfall in the surrounding desert. And the new coastline could support agriculture, tourism, and settlements. It sounded perfect. Too perfect. Because as with most things that sound too good to be true, there were some minor complications. 
Let's start with the engineering nightmare. You need to move water 60 kilometers inland, through solid rock and sand, uphill in some places, downhill in others. The Mediterranean coast isn't conveniently positioned right at the edge of the depression. There's a ridge in the way, a big one. So you have two options. Option one, dig an open canal, creating a channel wide and deep enough to let seawater flow continuously. We're talking about moving more earth than the Suez Canal, which took 10 years and 1.5 million workers to complete in the 1860s. Option two, blast a tunnel. This was actually the preferred method in the 1970s because it's more efficient and less disruptive to the landscape. But here's where it gets spicy. The original plan called for using nuclear explosives to carve the tunnel. Yeah, nukes. Over 200 nuclear bombs detonated underground to blast a path through the rock. Because what could possibly go wrong with detonating 200 nukes in a populated country? This was the 1970s. Remember, the Cold War era, when nuclear technology was seen as the solution to everything. The U.S. had a program called Project Plowshare, which explored peaceful uses of nuclear explosions. They wanted to use nukes to dig canals, create harbors, even fracking for natural gas. The Soviet Union had a similar program. So Egypt figured, why not? Let's nuke the desert for progress. Unsurprisingly, this plan didn't sit well with a lot of people. Environmental groups freaked out. Neighboring countries expressed concerns about radioactive fallout and Egypt itself started having second thoughts about irradiating part of their country, even if it was a remote, uninhabitable part. But the dream didn't die. In the 1980s, the project was revived with conventional explosives and excavation methods. Engineers calculated it would still take years and cost billions of dollars. But it was technically feasible. Economically feasible? That was debatable. Environmentally feasible? That's where things get interesting. Because here's what nobody really thought through in the initial excitement. What happens when you dump trillions of liters of seawater into a below sea level depression in the middle of the desert? What are the long-term consequences of creating a massive artificial lake in one of the driest regions on Earth? The answers, as it turns out, are complicated and not entirely reassuring. Let's talk hydroelectric power first, since that was one of the main selling points. Yes, water flowing downhill generates electricity. The drop from sea level to the floor of the depression is significant. 133 meters at the deepest point. That's a lot of gravitational potential energy. Initial estimates suggested the project could generate between 2,000 and 4,000 megawatts of power. That's roughly equivalent to two large nuclear power plants. Right? But here's the catch. That's only during the filling phase. Once the lake reaches equilibrium, where inflow equals evaporation, the power generation drops dramatically because water would only flow in to replace what evaporates. And in the Sahara Desert, evaporation rates are astronomical. The depression would evaporate about five to six meters of water per year. That's 16 feet annually just vanishing into the atmosphere. You get hydroelectric power, but it's not a one-time flood and done. It's a continuous process that requires constant inflow to maintain the lake level, which means you're not creating a sustainable hydroelectric dam like Hoover Dam or Aswan. You're creating a giant evaporation pond that happens to generate electricity as a side effect. The power output would be significant initially, then taper off to maybe 600 to 1000 megawatts once equilibrium is reached. Still substantial, but nowhere near the initial projections. Would a massive lake in the desert really moderate the climate and increase rainfall? The Mediterranean Sea does have a moderating effect on coastal climates. Bodies of water absorb heat during the day and release it at night reducing temperature extremes. They also increase local humidity. More humidity could theoretically lead to more cloud formation and rainfall. But the Sahara Desert exists for a reason. It's positioned in a belt of high pressure systems that suppress rainfall. The Hadley cell circulation pattern creates descending dry air over the Sahara, which is why it's a desert in the first place. A single artificial lake, even a massive one, isn't going to override global atmospheric circulation patterns. Some studies suggest the lake might increase local rainfall by 10 to 20%. That's something, but it's not turning the Sahara into a rainforest. You might get some vegetation around the lake shore. You might moderate temperatures slightly, but you're not fundamentally changing the climate. What you are changing is the local ecosystem and not necessarily in a good way.
The Katera Depression might look like a barren wasteland, but it's actually home to unique desert species, adapted to extreme conditions. Fennec foxes, sand vipers, gazelles, and various bird species use the area. Flooding it would destroy their habitat entirely. But hey, who cares about a few desert foxes when you're building a lake, right? There's also the issue of what happens to all that evaporated water. Five to six meters of evaporation per year means you're pumping enormous amounts of water vapor into the atmosphere. Where does it go? Does it increase humidity in Cairo, 300 kilometers to the east? Does it alter precipitation patterns across North Africa? Does it affect the Mediterranean climate? Nobody really knows, because nobody's ever created an artificial lake this size in a desert environment. And then there's the salt. Oh boy, the salt. Seawater contains about 3.5% salt. When water evaporates, the salt stays behind. So as the lake evaporates and refills continuously, the salt concentration increases. Over time, you're not looking at a freshwater lake or even a seawater lake. You're looking at a hypersaline lake possibly saltier than the Dead Sea. That's great if you want to float effortlessly, but terrible for supporting marine life or using the water for anything practical. The lake bed would accumulate salt deposits, potentially creating vast salt flats around the edges as water levels fluctuate seasonally. Wind would pick up salt particles and distribute them across the surrounding desert, potentially contaminating groundwater and soil hundreds of kilometers away. You might actually make the surrounding desert even more inhospitable than it already is. Congratulations, you've created a giant salt shaker that's seasoning North Africa. But wait, there's more. Let's talk about what happens to the Mediterranean coast itself. You're diverting enormous quantities of seawater inland. Does that affect coastal currents, salinity levels, marine ecosystems near the intake? The Mediterranean is already a relatively enclosed sea with limited water exchange with the Atlantic. Messing with its circulation patterns could have unintended consequences for fisheries coastal erosion, and even regional climate. And we haven't even discussed the geopolitical implications. Libya sits right next door to the Kashira Depression. What happens when Egypt starts redirecting Mediterranean water on a massive scale? Does Libya get a say? What about other Mediterranean nations? Does this count as water diversion under international law? These questions don't have clear answers because nothing like this has ever been attempted. So after decades of planning, calculating, debating, and revising, Egypt still hasn't pulled the trigger on the Katera Depression project. The most recent revival happened in 2019, when some Egyptian engineers proposed a scaled-down version using solar power instead of hydroelectric. Fill the depression slowly over decades. Create a lake gradually. Minimize environmental disruption. It's more cautious, more measured, and probably more realistic. But as of right now, December 2025, the Katera Depression remains exactly what it's been for millennia. A giant hole in the ground filled with salt and sand, and absolutely nothing else. Will Egypt eventually flood it? Maybe. The country's population pressures aren't going away. Climate change is making the Nile less reliable. Desalination technology is improving, which could address the salinity issues. And the potential benefits, both real and imagined, remain tantalizing. But here's the thing about massive geoengineering projects. They're really good at solving the problem you think you have and creating a dozen new problems you didn't anticipate. The Aral Sea in Central Asia is a perfect example. Soviet engineers diverted rivers to irrigate cotton fields. Catastrophic for the sea, which lost 90% of its volume and turned into a toxic salt desert. Whoops. Egypt's got a better understanding of environmental consequences than the Soviet Union did in the 1960s. But they're still proposing to fundamentally alter a massive geological feature that's been stable for thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians saw the Katara Depression. The Romans knew about it. Napoleon's cartographers mapped it. And all of them looked at that giant hole in the ground and thought, you know what, let's just leave that alone. Maybe they were onto something. Or maybe Egypt will prove that humanity can successfully engineer its way out of population and resource pressures by reshaping the desert itself. It'll be one of the most spectacular and potentially terrifying engineering projects in human history. A man-made inland sea in the Sahara Desert. What could possibly go wrong? Thanks for watching. If you found this fascinating, hit that subscribe button because we've got more stories about humanity's ambitious and occasionally insane attempts to reshape the planet.
and let us know in the comments. Would you flood the desert or leave it alone? See you next time.